I'm going to show you how to create a VRO action. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Vavork. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. Start now by subscribing and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing. VRO actions are the secret sauce that makes dynamic drop-down lists and other dynamic content possible in custom forms. So let's head over to the lab environment and start creating some VRO actions. As you can see, I'm already logged into Orchestrator. If you don't know how to log into Orchestrator, Make certain you check out the playlist. You're going to want to go back to video number one where I showed you how to log into Orchestrator. But I'm already logged into Orchestrator. Many times when you hear people talking about Orchestrator, actually most of the time when you hear people talking about Orchestrator, they're talking about something called an Orchestrator workflow. Now what's a workflow? Well, to me, workflow is just a fancy word for a program that I write or somebody else writes for me. It's just a program that automates some sort of task. So if you want to see some workflows, let's go click on library workflows. And each of these cards that you see here is a different workflow. Uh, there are, actually, let me hit the list view. There we go. As you can see uh, in list view, if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workflows in VRealize Orchestrator right out of the box. So let's take a look at some of them. In fact, let's uh, take a look just as an example um, let's look at this one here called just randomly selecting one. How about uh, JDBC URL generator? So let's look at that. And each of these cards is a workflow. This is one that's used for database connections. Uh, without worrying about all the details of exactly what it does, let's actually look inside it. And you'll see that each workflow has all these different tabs, but the one I really want to show you here is this tab labeled schema. In an orchestrator workflow, this schema, that's what this is here. This is the schema. The schema tells orchestrator what we want this workflow to do. And we build this schema by dragging schema elements from the left side of the screen over into the design canvas in the middle. It's kind of like that form designer that we saw in Service Broker. So here we have a schema. Uh, every schema has a start element and at least one end element. And in between those two, we drag in different schema elements, such as this one here is a scriptable task. I'll explain that in a moment. And this other one here is a schema element that calls another workflow. So with the scriptable task, let me actually select this one here. With the scriptable task, we can type in code in JavaScript. So this code here is JavaScript code. Now we're not going to dive into how to write that JavaScript code, but it's easier than you might think. And one thing that makes it easy in Orchestrator is oftentimes you don't have to write code at all. For instance, there are many, many, many workflows, including this one that we're calling here, that is already pre-programmed to do something. Instead of having to write all that JavaScript code, I just drag in one of these workflow schema elements, drop it into my schema, tell it what workflow I want to call, and it takes care of the rest for me. So again, if this is this thing here is the blueprint, excuse me, the workflow designer, the little blue arrows that I'm exposing here show the path through this schema. This is what people are usually talking about when they talk about Orchestrator is a workflow and it's schema. But Orchestrator workflows are not what Service Brokers custom forms is going to call. The custom form, when we choose external source, doesn't not call a Orchestrator workflow, but rather it calls something else called an action. Now what an action is, is a small reusable chunk of code. Again, it's in JavaScript but it's a small chunk of code that we can reuse in this workflow. We can use that same action in other workflows and we can use actions in other contexts such as VRealize Automation. In VRA, Service Broker 
can call whatever action we specify. The action will do whatever we program it to do. The action will return something like a string or perhaps an array of strings. And that return value that we get back from the action is going to be the contents of our dropdown list or some other dynamic component that we put into our custom form. So what we're going to do here, we're not going to create any orchestrated workflows because that's not what the service broker custom form designer needs. What we're going to do here is create a couple of VRO actions. And to do so, we're not going to drag this action schema element over into my workflow designer because again, we're not creating a workflow. So we need to leave this workflow entirely. We're going to click close. I made some changes. I moved things around slightly, but I'm going to tell it, don't worry, I don't need to save these things. I'm going to leave the workflow designer. And instead of going to workflows, I'm going to go to actions. And here in actions, you can see all the different actions that have already been defined. Uh, by the way, if I want to find a particular action or for that matter, a particular workflow, I can search for it a variety of ways. For instance, if I know the name of the action, like get all the M's, I can search by name or I can search by tags. I can search by lots of different things. So for instance, I can, wow, there's a whole bunch of things. There's more than just get all the M's. If I call get all the M's, that action returns me an array of every single VM that my vCenter server knows about. On the other hand, I can call similar actions such as get all VMs of compute resource. Compute resource is just a fancy word for cluster. I can say, and we also have one called get all VMs of cluster. The difference between these two is a cluster is a cluster. A compute resource can be a cluster or a standalone host. Or I can say get all the VMs from a, of a particular data center or lots of different choices here. But we're not going to use one of these existing ones because I want to show you how to create an action from scratch. So let me clear the filter here. Again, I could have filtered uh, by lots of different criteria, but I don't want to find an existing filter. I, want, I don't want to find an existing action. I want to create a new action. So I'll click new action. And the first thing I'm going to do is give it a name. Now by convention, uh, we name our actions as follows. We name our action by shoving a bunch of words together, like get vegetable, because this action is going to return a single string. Uh, that string will be a vegetable. But when we shove those words together to make it easy to read the name of this action, we capitalize the first word, uh, not of the first, not the first letter of the first word, but all subsequent words, we uppercase the first letter so that it makes it easy to read. Uh, that's a naming convention called camel case. It's called camel case because this, this action name has a hump in the middle of it. Uh, you don't have to use camel case, but we use camel case for our actions and variables within orchestrator workflows. Uh, we suggest, strongly suggest, we encourage you, we recommend you use camel case, but as long as you pick a name that's a valid identifier according to the JavaScript language, you can call it whatever you want. But I'm going to use the camel case naming convention. Now the next thing I need to do is tell it the name of the package I want my action stored in. A package is a collection of actions. Uh, packages can contain other things too. For instance, a package could also contain workflows and other things called resources and configurations and so forth. But for right now, we're just going to create a package that's just going to contain the two actions that we're about to define. So I'm going to call my action. You, you'll notice these actions are all called com.vmware.something.something. Um, the, the, the naming convention here, you don't have to follow this exactly, but the naming convention most folks follow is take your domain name, such as vmware.com, reverse it, and then slap some other dot this dot that on the end. For instance, my domain name is v vork.info, so I'm going to reverse that, info.vvork, and then I can call my package whatever I want. Uh, for instance, I could call it info.vvork.food, and you may notice that it already says that down below because before I did this video, I already defined the package, but if I type the name of a new package and simply hit enter, 
that'll create a new package. Or if I select an existing package, it'll add my action to that package. So I'm going to choose info.vavork.food. Again, I know this is a contrived example, but that's what I'm going to call it. Info.vavork.food is the name of the package. And to start with, it's going to have one action in it called get vegetable. All right, so uh, I need a description. Always type descriptions in Orchestrator. So I'm going to say um, um, this action, I'm going to spell it correctly, this action re turns one one vegetable 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 there we go i.e a string this guy's going to return a string not a string a string there we go i can version my actions i can do the same thing with workflows but let me give my action a version if i uh if i make changes to this action in the future i can change that version number so we can do versioning I can assign a tag to, in fact, I can assign multiple tags to my actions and workflows. I like slapping the tag Vavork on mine. Again, this is the Vavork YouTube channel, so I always slap Vavork onto mine because that makes it easy to find my workflows later on by searching for that tag. Uh, notice, however, it's also going to automatically get uh, this tag here, info.vork.food. The, the package name is also going to be slapped on as a tag on this action. But I'm going to choose Vavork. It's also automatically going to get info.vavork.food. And the next thing I need to do, perhaps the most important thing to do, is go over to the script tab and start typing some code. So my action needs some JavaScript code to say what it's going to do. And I'm going to type that code here on the script tab in this section here. But before I do, I'm going to go down to the section here labeled return type to say what my action is going to return. In the case of this action, it's going to return a single string. If I wanted to return multiple strings, I would check array. But I just want a single string here, so I'll leave array unchecked. The other thing that I could do if I needed to, I don't need to in this case, but if this action requires some sort of input, some sort of information for it to do what it's going to do, I can add these things called input parameters. But we're going to keep this simple here and simply define the return type is a string. So we're going to return the vegetable as a string. So now we need to write some code. So I can write JavaScript code. Uh, let's write some nice looking code. var, that's used to declare a variable. var, my vegetable, that's the name of my variable. Again, notice I'm using camel case for all my variable names. Equals. And if I wanted to, I could be really explicit here and say this is a new string, but I can just actually type the string in quotes. So why don't we say my vegetable is, why don't we say zucchini? I didn't say that before over in, in the service broker, so it should be really obvious here shortly that zucchini is coming from uh, this action. In JavaScript, statements are terminated by semicolons, so I'm going to type a semicolon. And then, remember how I said we're going to return something? Well, I need to return something. So I'm going to type return. And I could just type my vegetable. Uh, notice it gives me autocomplete down below. I can just uh, select the item that I want it to insert. Or I can hit tab, and it'll do the insertion. Uh, additionally, you may have noticed, I don't have to type parentheses here. But you may notice if I'm using things like parentheses or quotes, the editor automatically um, adds the closing quote, and I just need to fill it in. So I'm going to say my vegetable. I can type a portion of it, hit tab. And I do need to remember to type that semicolon, and I'm done. So I've now defined an a action, a VRO action, not an AVX action, but a VRO action that returns a single string, and that string is, a, is in this case, is a zucchini. So I've got my first action. But we're going to create another one. So let's click Create, click Close, and now we're going to create another action. Except that this action is not going to return one vegetable. It's going to return multiple fruits. Because remember, our dynamic drop-down list is supposed to show an array of fruits. So let's uh, do this here. So I'm going to create another action by going to Library Actions. I'm going to click on New Action. Once again, I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to call this one Get Fruits. 
Again, I'll say what module I want to put it in. So I want this in info.vovork.food. I type a description. This action returns a list of fruits, uh, specifically an array of strings. Again, I'll type a version number. I'll type a tag so that it makes it easier to find this action later on. And once again, I'm going to go to the script tab. This time, our action is not going to return a single string. It's going to return an array of strings. So not just one string, multiple strings. So let's write the code. Again, I could define input parameters in the lower right hand corner is that input button that's scrolled off the screen, but we're not going to have any input parameters. Instead, we're just going to declare a variable. Let's say my fruits is equal to I'm going to declare a new object of type array. When you call a, 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 the array constructor method, uh, we need to put parentheses because that's what you do with methods. I put the semicolon, and now that variable called myFruits is suitable for shoving some strings that mention fruits. Now, what I'm going to do here ultimately is I'm going to return myFruits. But I need to fill up that array with some tasty fruits. So let's do that. I can do that a variety of ways. I'm going to do it this way. My fruit dot, excuse me, my fruits dot push allows me to push something into the array. I'm going to push, uh, why don't we say, let's see, different fruits. How about uh, we already did apple, banana, and cherry. This time, why don't we do date? And we're going to do some others. Let me copy this line. I'll paste it, paste it again, paste it a third time. Let's see. So date, uh, eggplant, is that a fruit? And fig. I'm pretty sure figs are fruits. So I'm pushing these items into the array. And if I wanted to, I don't have to limit myself to three. Tell you, why don't we... Do those three plus, why don't we also add an apple, banana, and, and I can't type, and cherry. So we got apple, banana, cherry, date, eggplant, and fig. Uh, you'll notice here I'm just typing simple strings. We saw earlier in the pre, I think it was the previous video, that when you define a drop down list statically, you can. Um, specify each of these items with a pipe delimited triplet where the triplet is a value label and a description. We could do the same thing here, but I didn't want to type all that again. So I'm taking a shortcut here. So we've got apple, banana, cherry, date, eggplant, and fig. Again, I hope those are all fruits. So now I have two different actions. Let me, let me create this one and close. And now I have two actions that I can hook up to my custom form so that the custom form gets the things it displays, not from a statically hard-coded um, list, but rather by calling these VRO actions. In the next video, I'll show you how to use our VRO actions as external sources.